Okay, I think I think we can get started here. Uh, any questions before I start with the lecture? Okay, so I will uh, try to pay attention and uh, notice if the chat uh, opens up or not. It uh, I'll try to grab that stuff. So we left off uh, Wednesday, uh, finished talking about uh, some of the uh, the protozoal organisms and then uh, the worms. And now we want to shift over and think about uh, fungi. So there's all sorts of, uh, of variation when we think about fungus. Oftentimes, uh, you know, I think about mushrooms as, as a good example, but um, there's numerous potentials, molds and yeasts. Uh, all sorts of uh, possibilities. And we've got a couple of examples here uh, of the, the hyphae, uh, which are like the, the thread-like uh, strands of the fungus that we see. Uh, over here are some yeast cells and they're a little, little bit different. And I kind of, I'm kind of not so happy with this image right here, but that's okay. Um, so the septate uh, have, uh, well, divisions in between each of the cells and you can see the nuclei, the dots here. So they're, uh, it almost looks like you're looking at a, at a plant cell uh, with this. So uh, the cenocytic uh, or cenozoic either way, uh, it's a whole continuum of fungi, uh, of the fungi. So big long thread-like strand with no uh, cell wall divisions in between. The cell walls of these guys uh, are made up of chitin, uh, which you can see in like crustaceans and things like that, uh, making the exoskeleton. So it provides a, a hard uh, barrier to the outside. It's uh, you know definitely different than the bacterial peptidoglycan layer, but it's still a similar idea as far as cell wall uh, material. The yeast cells over here, typically oval shaped, uh, and really, you know, I said it kind of, kind of not so happy with this. Uh, this really looks more like hyphae, uh, and they do have some of them have the potential to produce pseudo hyphae. So, not true thread-like strands, but it kind of appears that way. And this image almost looks kind of like the septate hyphae that we've got uh, initially. A lot of times when the pseudo hyphae forms with these yeast cells, we think about them dividing very rapidly. So they uh, replicate by a process called budding where one cell can produce numerous uh, daughter cells and we call it the one producing them the mother uh, and the, the offspring that would be budding off from them, the daughters. Uh, and there are potentials uh, where maybe you've got a, a really good culture, you've got a lot of nutrients, or maybe we're thinking, you know, a type of yeast infection where they're, they've uh, really growing unchecked. Uh, they can repl replicate very rapidly, and you can see uh, daughter cells uh, that are producing more daughter cells. So a mother cell with a daughter with a daughter on that, and so it looks like a big long. Uh, kind of hyphae, uh, the pseudo hyphae, but it's really not the same idea. They are uh, all separate and they will ultimately have the potential to kind of exist as a separate cell. It's just, they're not uh, fully separated from that mother cell. Uh, and again, growing rapidly like that, you can see almost chains of them linked together, uh, replicating very quickly. Uh, so it's, it's not, not exactly like that. One of them that we uh, wanna start with and uh, something that's really, uh, I think pretty interesting is a type of fungus called histoplasmic capsulatum. Uh, it's a type of fungus that we call a dimorphic fungus. And what we mean by that is it's got the potential and typically with the dimorphic fungi, uh, it's temperature dependency that uh, stimulates the the conversion in 
uh, types of, of morphology or types of fungus, if you will. Uh, so histoplasma is an organism that uh, grows, uh, it's, it's out in the environment, it grows in soil, uh, it's uh, especially uh, more common in areas that are uh, rich with nitrogen, especially areas that have, as it says here, you know, bird or bat feces. Uh, it's you know a little more conducive to allow for the the fungus to to kind of thrive uh, in that type of a habitat. So uh, in these environmental temperatures, uh, in a nice uh, nutrient rich environment, the fungi can thrive uh, as this mycelial stage, as we see here. Uh, a micrograph down below an actual image with the hyphae and then the conidia are these spores, uh, the reproductive structures that harbor the spores uh, that will be released. And, you know, the idea would be that uh, undisturbed, these spores would settle down back into the environment and continue to grow as uh, the mycelial phase as this uh, strands of hyphae. Uh, in the environment. However, uh, if we move over to the next frame, if the spores happen to be inhaled by a mammal, uh, a human in this instance, uh, they've got the potential to get into the lungs uh, to now be in a nice warm environment, body temperature at 37. Uh, and these spores, these uh, reproductive structures convert into yeast cells. That's what we've got the little image right here. And this shows they're, they're dividing. Uh, so here's a single one and then two of them in the process of division. So they get into the lungs, they convert into these yeast cells and they start replicating, uh, causing initially causing uh, pulmonary uh, manifestations, but the potential for these guys, and it might be, you know, kind of, uh, you know, how healthy the individual might be or maybe not. Uh, and sometimes that has really no bearing. Uh, it could be a, the total amount of uh, particle that was inoculated that sets the stage for adverse uh, effects. So the potential for these guys uh, to kind of go unchecked and then disseminate, and that's what this last little bit is, uh, moving out of the respiratory tract uh, into the lymphatics or the circulatory system has the potential to lend uh, to this uh, fungal infection to spread throughout the body. So we say it's a, it's a systematic type of fungal infection. So it's more than just the lungs um, that can be targeted. And, you know, you may typically recognize the pulmonary issues, but maybe not. Uh, and it might not be until there are lesions on the skin that uh, you get a diagnosis. And by that point, uh, you've got a, a serious fungal infection. Uh, with that said, uh, you know, we, we will hit these layers, we start talking the real infections, uh, but an infection called a mycosis, uh, and there are all sorts of different types of fungal infections, different types of mycoses uh, that can be skin deep, uh, to literally uh, systematic where your whole body is potentially plagued uh, with the respective organism. Um, so we'll mention a little of that as we move through. And if you recall, uh, we started this chapter with that image of the uh, ringworm uh, and a case study uh, with that. And that is a, it's a type of fungus that in that case uh, is, uh, restricted only to the to the skin. So this next, uh, really the next handful of slides talk about the different types uh, of fungi and it shows some uh, details about their reproductive process. I don't want you to get super uh, bogged down with the all of these details. Um, just recognize there are uh, various types of fungi and you know, some of the ways they reproduce, um, you're gonna see some similarities, but they have a few different names for some of the reproductive structures uh, that we see. And that uh, is somewhat important, but again, for really the, the idea in here, uh, not necessarily that critical. 
I do want to go through a little of it as, as we uh, progress, uh, just to kind of show some of the, the detail uh, and kind of complexity with these guys. They, you know, they seem very simple, but, um, you know, you think of molds or things like that, uh, you know, look at a, a loaf of bread with some mold on there and as you're ready to toss it out. Uh, but to think about it a little more uh, detailed kind of uh, is impressive to me. So we start off here at the top uh, with these uh, zygomycetes with their life cycle. They have both sexual and asexual uh, life cycles. Most of the fungi uh, you can see uh, exhibiting this. There are a few where uh, we only recognize an asexual cycle, but that it's, it's kind of a little bit of a fuzzy area because that doesn't necessarily mean that's all they have. Uh, it's just that maybe the sexual phase has yet to be, you know, uh, really figured out. So we'll, I'll kind of leave it with that. A lot of the time, uh, as we're looking at uh, this top bit, uh, we can see the fungi growing, thriving in that environment, replicating asexually by mitosis. Uh, so just cell to cell growing, all right? Uh, a lot of this process is happening as we're seeing it, but there's also the process for the sexual uh, phase of this fungi. And that in turn gives rise to more mycelia and the cycle in turn can progress. So germination of these spores results in the mycelia, right? That we see happening up here. It goes through rounds of mitosis, it replicates, uh, and we get these big, you know, filamentous masses of hyphae that we call mycelia, right? So all of the thread-like projections together are mycelia. Uh, so there are potentials with this mycelia uh, that we may have some opposite mating types. We call them plus and minus. It's not, you know, male and female, but they are opposite mating types. Uh, and so if it happens that you have two uh, hyphae that are in pretty close proximity to one another and they happen to be opposite mating types, uh, they can come together. Uh, 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 you know, love is in the air, if you will. Uh, they form these projections, these extensions from each of their cells and they make contact. Uh, the gametangia, uh, forms. It's basically the, the union at this point. Uh, it's starting to form between these two opposite mating types. Uh, plasma gamete uh, occurs where they actually fuse together the two cells. Uh, and this produces the zygosporangium. So this is what's going to give rise to the, the fruiting body, if you will, the, the uh, cells that are going to release the spores up above, right? So uh, it creates uh, this double nucleated uh, cell. It goes through rounds of division, uh, forming this zygote with multiple diploid nuclei. That starts going through meiosis. Uh, each of these nuclei dividing, creating uh, from what was diploid, many haploid spores within the sporangium uh, that will rupture releasing them out and they germinate and start to grow. Cycle is complete. Uh, so there's a period of time that, you know, they're diploid, uh, if you will. It's really, you know, this kind of union of the two haploid, which is this sexual phase, but it's, it's not, like I said, it's not the same thinking like animal cells with egg and sperm. Um, so that's the zygomyces. And here uh, is an image with some of the bread mold that we can see and the dark bits on here uh, as we blow that up are the reproductive structures, the sporangium uh, attached to the hyphae. And you can see the little thread-like projections. You definitely can see hyphae on here, the white fuzz, um, the threads. And all of it together, this big collection of hyphae we would call mycelia or mycelium. Um, 
So many moldy bits on there would be mycelia, plural. Uh, so, and these, uh, you know, just a handful of different things. So mucor is a mold that's found indoors. It could be something that's also so a, a potential on uh, bread. Rhizopus is more, maybe more common on bread, uh, but both of which could maybe be on something like that. So uh, here's another one with uh, these guys with their ascus and ascospores. So the ascus harbors these spores, um, this um, from a, a different type of fungi. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to make you spell that. Uh, it's all fine and good. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, this next image, uh, this is Aspergillus. This is one that it's, you know, mostly common in soils and plants. It is a, a potential pathogen, uh, a toxic type of fungi. It's one that uh, you've probably heard of sick building syndrome. Uh, there are issues with that where it could be pollutants like formaldehydes or other things in there, but there's also issues where it's fungi that are in there and the aspergillus is definitely a contributing factor to that. Uh, it can be seen sometimes in poorly ventilated bathrooms, uh, you know, that don't, uh, you know, they, they don't dry out thoroughly that allows for uh, kind of toward the ceiling, some of this uh, blackish looking uh, mold to grow. And a lot of the time it's aspergillus. So uh, if you have some of that, I recommend, uh, you know, wiping that down with some 10% uh, bleach solution, that'll get rid of that. Uh, maybe not for forever, but uh, it'll knock it back for quite a while. Uh, and this last one, this is Candida, Candida albicans. These are yeast cells. Uh, so uh, it can cause candidiasis, so vaginal uh, yeast infection or thrush. Uh, there are also potentials for uh, infections with this. And typically we think immunocompromised people uh, but there are potentials for it to go systemic and disseminate, and you can see multiple organ involvement. Uh, and in those circumstances, the prognosis is very poor. Uh, so these guys, uh, here we can see just numerous yeast cells, uh, all the little cells, and the potential, you can see a few in here that look almost pseudo hyphae like as we've got them kind of connected together. Uh, here, they're basically just grow one out of, out of control. You've got lots of them all kind of piled up. Um, almost, you know, they're huge, but it almost is like looking at the staphylococci where they're all clustered together. Um, again, much, much larger. And you can see the nuclei, you can see details. You would know uh, looking at a smear uh, that this individual had candidiasis and not, you know, uh, some bacterial vaginosis or something like that. Um, you could definitely differentiate that. Uh, every time I see this, it kind of, you know, I, I feel like I'm looking at uh, peas in a pod as I see this um, bit right here. These ascospores uh, are all lined up in this ascus uh, and they are, again, the, the spores that have been produced uh, through sexual uh, replication and it's back to uh, these guys right here. Uh, so with these, uh, and that's back to, here's the peas in the pod, uh, ascomyces, it produces the ASCII uh, with the sexual phase. The haploid phase uh, that we see up here is the predominant phase uh, with that, sorry, the, just seeing the, the mycelia uh, where they're growing like this, right? Uh, and then the potential uh, in the sexual phase with this union uh, and the production uh, of the ascospores within the ascus happens. But typically we think, you know, maybe multiple rounds uh, of replication populations, uh, you know, really increasing before this occurs. Uh, typically lots of just mitosis uh, and growth that way. And I'm not gonna go through that cycle. It's they all kind of bear some similarity to the first one that we went through with the fusion of the opposite mating types and so on. Uh, the seeds, uh, diploid generations. Uh, so the haploid generations prolonged uh, with a dicarion, so this fusion multinucleated cell, uh, and then the production of the fruiting body. Uh, 
the Basidio carp uh, with Basidia in the gill filaments uh, of that mushroom. Uh, the Basidio carp is the, the mushroom. Uh, so these guys uh, relatively common. Uh, something you can you know find at the supermarket or as you know the spring starts to happen I am looking out the window and seeing snow all over uh, but you can see them you know toadstools and things like that growing in your lawn as they emerge after typically after a good rain or something like that under uh, in the soil uh, there's all sorts of mycelia all sorts of uh, of hyphae uh, growing and absorbing nutrients, and then the fruiting bodies emerge, releasing spores uh, for more mycelia to continue to grow. So uh, it really kind of just depends. There's all sorts of variation uh, with the basidiomycetes. Um, but again, typically thinking uh, mushrooms, there is, uh, here's a table, uh, there is uh, one Cryptococcus neoformans that fits within the basidiomycota that is uh, something that is uh, definitely pathogenic, um, the others not. But there are some issues uh, with some of these guys uh, with toxins and things like that. So there are definitely some potential uh, that you know could cause problems. But the cryptococcus is one that's definitely a pathogen in and of itself. Uh, so ascomycota that we started with. Uh, there's a handful of different potentials, um, and you can see there are, uh, you know, a few examples, edible mushrooms here. I don't know if, I think these guys really need to be down below. Uh, the the city of mycota are the edible. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say that, but I'm pretty sure the asco mycota are not edible mushrooms. I think that's an issue uh, with the table. Doesn't matter. Uh, here you can see the medically important ones. So the fungal infections uh, and then some of the diamorphic fungi, blastomyces and histoplasma, and there's uh, a couple others. Uh, microsporidia, uh, we haven't uh, really talked about these guys yet, but they're a little different. Uh, and um, here's an enterocystisolin, uh, zygomycota, the molds like uh, rhizopus and mucor um, that we had mentioned before. So, uh, uh, got a question in here. Audio breaking up. I apologize for that. I I am getting a, a couple of messages saying that I, my internet is unstable. Uh, so hopefully, uh, well, bear with me. Uh, if I completely stop, please uh, let me know. Um, hopefully I don't freeze up or anything like that. Uh, this next one, uh, this shows the micro and macro canidium. Uh, this is with trichophyte and rurium uh, dermatophyte. So the ringworm that we started with, this could be one of the potentials. There's a handful of culprits that can cause ringworm, uh, but maybe this guy. Um, all right, shifting uh, the dianoflagellates, uh, we're now starting to think about um, the, the algae. Uh, and I think this image is really pretty cool looking. Uh, there's all sorts of diversity in the shape uh, of these guys. Um, they're encased in cellulose armor, some flagella, uh, and uh, yeah, these pretty interesting. Um, we think about other things as well. Uh, with that diatoms, uh, as we see here, as I see that dianoflagellate, it makes me think about some of these guys uh, with the you know, really complex shape and uh, yeah, pretty uh, impressive. So initially, as we uh, look at this, it's uh, all sorts of potentials when we think about the, the algae, there's multicellular and single cellular. Uh, there are, you know, the multicellular, like the seaweeds and kelp, uh, they look like plants. They uh, are not plants, but they definitely appear to have uh, some similarities for sure. Uh, so um, 
the first one, uh, some algae. Um, the next uh, red algae that has does have the potential with some red tides to cause some issues. Uh, another green algae, uh, and it looks definitely kind of plant-like. There's some that have bioluminescence. Uh, the diatoms, all sorts of variation with them, and their exoskeletons are uh, full, like full of silica, which is like almost you know sand, but like a, a glass shard almost. And uh, they provide diatomaceous earth if you garden and want some organic gardening uh, in insecticide that. Uh, is pretty effective is diatomaceous earth. Uh, sprinkling around the tomatoes or whatever uh, provides uh, a barrier and the insect crawls through that and it gets into the exoskeleton and basically cuts it up and that's the end. Um, kind of crazy. Uh, and then here's some uh, Volvox. Uh, these are single celled algal cells. Um, so, um, Okay. Uh, Chlamydia monas, uh, this is a unicellular green al algae, uh, flagellated cells, and they've uh, got chloroplasts in there for um, photosynthesizing. Uh, rat we're almost done with this uh, section of stuff. Uh, the next bit uh, are the lichens. And lichens are a symbiotic relationship. Uh, it's really pretty impressive. Uh, so you can see multiple zones here, the cortex, the algal zone, the medu uh, medulla, uh, the lower cortex, and then these uh, risings. So the, uh, with this, uh, the cortex, uh, the upper bit, has the fungal hyphae, uh, the thread-like projections, uh, and it provides uh, some protection uh, to the cells underneath. Uh, underneath that layer uh, are, are the algal cells where photosynthesis is occurring, producing sugars that's going to feed this whole community of organisms. Uh, uh, the medulla layer has uh, more fungal hyphae uh, and helping to absorb and break down nutrients. Uh, and then the rhizines anchor uh, the whole thing to a substrate. They're important uh, in providing, uh, you know, or forming, uh, reshaping environments uh, with soil. Uh, as they colonize, they help to uh, collect, uh, they break down substrate. You see them uh, kind of on uh, things that um, you know are really pretty impressive to see some of the the variation uh, with them, and that's what we've got a handful of different uh, potentials with these lichens. There's also some uh, possibilities of cyanobacteria taking up uh, associations in this complex. Uh, it doesn't have to just be algal uh, cells within there. Uh, so kind of rust colored ones, this crustose lichen. Uh, here's one that's uh, uh follows, I don't know how to say that, uh, leaf-like. Uh, and then this wispy looking one right here, uh, uh, fruticose lichen, this uh, toxic maybe uh, a little bit. Uh, it says here wants to make poison arrowheads. I think that's kind of impressive. It looks uh, like stuff I've seen just hiking around. I've seen all of these things, I feel like. Uh, and there's definitely some potentials with different kind of color variation within there, again, dependent upon the type of symbiote uh, that might be within. Okay, I'm going to stop that. And let me see. If I can, oops. Sorry, hold on one second. Okay, hopefully, let me I've got there's too many things on the screen to get it. All right.
I just want to introduce this chapter. I want to just get the littlest bit uh, in here. And and then we'll stop with that for, for the weekend. So uh, on the test, are you wanting us to know the genus and species of all of the organisms we've talked about, or do you want us to know them more generally? And uh, at this point, it's going to be more generally. Uh, I, you know, I don't expect there were a number of different organisms that we've kind of talked about. Um, I don't expect you to know all of that right now. When we get to the disease uh, portions toward the tail end, that's really where it's more organism stuff. Lots of body sites, lots of, of specific uh, names to think about. Uh, but for this, not. Uh, I do have a summary. Uh, that I have, uh, I, I forgot to post it yesterday. I'll get it posted onto Moodle and I will get a review together as well. Uh, I recognize Monday is a holiday. Um, that's true, right? I think that is true. Uh, so uh, I wanna get a chunk of this lecture today so that um, we'll have a little more time uh, next week to have some review as well. Um, so. I will also see if I can uh, get a, a, like an office hour or something set up uh, on Zoom where we can have like a little review time that's you know not uh, not at the same time, not during lecture time. Um, we'll see if if that's something that uh, people want. So, okay, this last uh, chapter for this unit of material uh, is relatively short. The acellular pathogens, uh, the bulk of it we wanna think about are virus, uh, but there are other uh, ideas with things like uh, prions, the proteinaceous uh, particles that can cause, well, uh, some serious issues. But again, the main focus really is, is virus. Uh, and with that, um, there's you know a lot of detail uh, uh, that you know and names you don't need to really get bogged down with with that. So uh, initially we we start off uh, thinking about uh, something that I really find quite terrifying. Uh, Ebola virus is something that uh, I think a lot of us know a little bit about and maybe some of what we know about it is not really accurate. Uh, we've been kind of told things that are maybe a little embellished, uh, I would say. And some of that is uh, you know, the work of things like the hot zone uh, where we're told kind of a fantastical uh, example of how the disease rips through the body and you bleed out of every orifice. Um, that's not necessarily 100% accurate. Um, it is definitely something that's uh, very serious, highly contagious, um, but um, maybe not quite uh, as gruesome of, uh, of a picture as maybe we may have in our minds. That's okay, I still don't want it. Uh, this is a uh, filovirus, a thread-like virus um, that we see here. And here is a, was an outbreak in 2014, uh, numerous cases in uh, Africa where uh, we can see these issues and there's definitely questions as far as where uh, this has originated. There are some pretty fascinating books that kind of talk about this uh, and you know thoughts of epidemics. Uh, not that we're not in the midst of a issue right now uh, with a pandemic. Not thankfully, not Ebola. Um, so initially. Uh, we want to think a little bit about the first uh, recognition, the first uh, real uh, understanding of these particles uh, that were causing issues and they were so small that it couldn't be bacteria. Uh, what could it be? Uh, and 
tobacco mosaic virus was the first uh, that was really kind of studied and filtered uh, and uh, shown to cause this. These are uh, a handful of tobacco leaves that are uh, infected in various stages of infection um, with the virus. And here's an image uh, of some of the viral uh, particles right here. So the, I think we've, I think I've got an image here. I've got an image in a couple of slides down uh, that will talk a little bit about the filtration. And I, so I'm gonna skip over that right now. Uh, this virus right here, this is, uh, I think, just fascinating. And I love seeing images of this. Uh, so this is an electron micrograph. This is uh, what we're seeing right here is a bacterial cell. Uh, we are super zoomed in, 50 nanometers is our ruler bar right here. So we're seeing the surface of a bacterial cell. Maybe it's E. coli. Uh, this is a type of bacterium that might plague uh, e. coli. Bacterial phages are viruses that infect bacteria. Uh, there are all sorts of possibilities with these guys. They have, you know, lots of viruses we think of having specificity, uh, only targeting one type of, of organism, maybe people, or maybe one type of bacterium, something like that. There are other types of viruses that are more generalists, like rabies is an example. If you're a mammal, it's likely you could contract it, right? So, Bacteriophages are uh, pretty specific with the types of bacteria that they target. Uh, and there are various potentials. They don't all look like these guys. But like I said, this is one of my favorites. I think of these uh, bacteriophages as I see them kind of like some sort of spacecraft, some sort of, uh, you know, alien uh, device landing on a new surface. Uh, you could almost imagine that's kind of accurate uh, as this happens uh, within the capsid. So this kind of head region, if you will, uh, within the capsid is where the nucle uh, nucleic material is. So either DNA or RNA, we'll hit that in a minute. They don't have both. It's, uh, you know, their genome is one or the other. Uh, within this capsid is this material, the nuclear material uh, that once it lands on or docks to the surface of a cell, uh, it will inject this material into that cell. Through the sheath, uh, there are these tail fibers that are like the landing gear. They make contact with the cell. Uh, this tail pin uh, will make contact with the cell and penetrate in, uh, almost like a hypodermic needle injecting uh, the genome into that cell. And at that point, the bacterial cell becomes infected and there's numerous potentials uh, with what could occur uh, as that gets in there, uh, different ways that the virus um, manifests itself. And um, we'll hit that here in just a second. Uh, there are definitely some potentials with this. I just wanna mention it right now as we've got this bacterial phage uh, image we think about problems with antibiotic resistance. We think about all sorts of bacteria that we are starting to call super pathogens that have the capabilities of, uh, you know, evading any sort of antibiotic that we throw at them. Uh, and that's pretty disturbing. Uh, there are questions as far as what do we do when we have no antibiotic to treat this? Um, some research is turning to bacteriophages and the potential to use a virus to infect a specific type of bacteria seems like a great idea uh, to maybe target uh, specific pathogens. This is something that may seem kind of out there, but I will tell you that there are definitely uh, some examples where elsewhere, uh, you know, uh, in Russia, uh, as an example, at the, you know, uh, right at the dawn of the you know antimicrobial revolution, if you will, in the early '40s uh, or late '30s, um, United States was on board, and we poured lots of research into that. 
uh, Soviet Union did it oppositely and they were not thinking antimicrobials like that. They went down the bacteriophage path uh, and they utilized things like that more commonly. Uh, so there's definitely some potentials with that. Uh, and uh, we are now researching more uh, into this thinking, could this be a solution? Uh, I question with that, you know, bacteria develop resistance to these antimicrobials. Could we not see similar things uh, happening with the bacterial phages? And maybe there could be some issues with that. Uh, but then there's other thoughts where, you know, the bacteria may be evolving some strategies. The virus also has the potential to change and evolve, to shift. Uh, whereas an antimicrobial, we don't see that happening. So there are maybe some potentials for these being more effective. And I guess the, you know, the jury's still out on that. We will, we will see what happens. Um, but I do think it's uh, interesting. And as we see this right here, um, you could think of, you know, having some of these little viruses uh, circulating around, seeking out those specific pathogens, finding, targeting, uh, and eliminating, um, it seems like a pretty good strategy to me. So uh, we do want to think a little bit size-wise uh, with the virus. Um, they are very, very small, uh, small enough that, you know, and it, uh, as we look at over here, um, the light microscope really, this is not accurate. We're not picking up these things with the light microscope, right? Uh, we get, it should be over here to this, to the micron range. We're not able to detect viruses uh, with light microscopes. Electron microscopes are what we employ to visualize these guys. Um, very, very small. With that said, there are a few exceptions. There are some virus uh, that are relatively large and maybe, maybe uh, able to see under a light microscope. Smallpox and the flu virus, you definitely can't see with a light microscope. Okay, enough with that. And I think, uh, I think that's a good point to stop. Uh, we will pick up, uh, I guess Wednesday, we'll pick up uh, with, the, uh, with this slide talking about some variation, naked or enveloped viruses and basically uh, if it's enveloped, it picks up part of the plasma membrane as it's leaving the cell, uh, and it's got that surrounding it. So a um, couple of potentials with that. Um, okay, any questions before I quit? I'm seeing nothing on my chat. It sounds silent. Okay, guys, I will, uh, like I said, I'll get that summary posted. I will also get some review questions uh, or something like that posted up on there. So you've got a little hint of uh, kind of what to be thinking about. Um, have a good weekend. I will see you all Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you.